patients. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So how do the laws compare? Well, like I just said, um, in high school, we have IDEA. Um, and IDEA is about success, success of the student. There's also Section 504. Now in high school, in terms of documentation, students will also often be given an individualized education plan, an IEP or 504. Um, and that's based on testing that is sometimes done through the school system itself because the school system might identify a student as potentially having a disability. Um, and then accommodations are determined based on a disability category, not necessarily based on the specific impact that that one particular student experiences. So in college, the ADA is about access. It does not guarantee success. Um, 504 is still around. Um, documentation in college, an IEP or a 504 is generally not sufficient. So if you're working with students and they're being prepped, they're prepping to transfer to college, first, their accommodations in high school do not follow them into college. Um, and just handing in a copy of an IEP or a 504 plan is most likely not going to meet that college's documentation requirements for medical documentation. Um, if the student has had recent psychoeducational evaluations, that will count as documentation, but we want the whole eval. Uh, or it might be medical documentation if it's a chronic health condition from someone's doctor or a specialist. The student is responsible for getting that documentation. So whereas in K-12, the, the school system is responsible for acquiring that for the student or helping them do that and identifying it, um, in higher ed, that's on the student. So we hope that they have that recent testing that they can bring with them. Otherwise, they may have to pay out of pocket, which is not what anyone wants. Um, and the documentation has to be current. That differs from school to school. For me, that means that if it's a, a psychoed eval, the tests have to be what's considered adult normed, which means that they're made for an adolescent through adult population, not just a children's population. And if it's medical documentation, it just has to talk about what's still relevant for that student. So in other words, I don't necessarily need to know what, what it was like for them when they were two. I need to know what it's like for them right now. Um, and then the responsibilities are different. Actually in K-12, you guys have way more responsibilities in terms of complying with IDEA than higher ed has in terms of complying with ADA. And what I mean by that is um, in K-12, students' success has to be guaranteed, which means um, students are identified by the school system. Their information is shared more freely amongst teachers and aides. Um, parents and guardians are involved in all the decision-making processes when determining accommodations. The student does not need to be present and oftentimes is not. Um, under K-12, the school provides even non-academic services. Um, and think about how much structure is in the day of a K-12 student. You know, they're in class from, let's say, 8 in the morning until 2.30 or 3.30 in the afternoon. Um, you know, they know when they eat lunch. They know when they go to study hall. They know when they have band practice or football practice. Um, so there's a lot of structure that's built in for them and a lot less unstructured or downtime. Um, the school system, they place the students in programs where they can benefit in any way. So that might be in a, a special ed classroom, it might be in a mainstream classroom, um, and they can modify because they, because in K-12 you guys have to guarantee success, it's acceptable um, to modify educational programs. So that means that you may have a class that's taking a test that's 30 questions. And for one student, in order to guarantee them success, a reasonable accommodation in K-12 could be that they take a test that's 15 questions or they take a test that's based on slightly um, less challenging material. And in K-12, that's okay. In college, it's different. So the school or the university has to protect the student's right to privacy and confidentiality. So once a student registers with my office, they might receive an accommodation letter, but they do not receive anything that they have to share with others that has their diagnosis or their symptoms, nothing like that. The accommodation letter doesn't include that information and I would need a signed written consent from that student to even share that with their parents or anyone else that doesn't have a need to know at the university. Um, my, the responsibilities of the college, we are, in, we are responsible for making sure that our students know, for example, where my office is here at Delaware State University and the procedure for requesting accommodations. 
um, the student has to be their own advocate. Um, we don't reach out to the student like there isn't we don't get a list of students who had IEPs or 504s in high school so that we would reach out to them. It's on the student to choose to want to disclose because at this point they're an adult. The college or the university, we provide access to programs and services for people with disabilities, and that's sometimes where accommodations will come in. The student is responsible for arranging their schedule. So we just talked about how much um, structured time there is in K-12. Something to be mindful of in college is that a student may only be in class, in a classroom, for 10 to 12 hours in a week. Um, and that means they have 35, 45 hours of time that is theirs. Um, so how are we preparing students to know how to manage their own time, manage their own schedule so that they can be an independent learner, which is kind of the expectation that any college student has on them. Um, they're responsible if they need like a personal aid or a personal attendant, the student has to arrange that. Um, it says in the law that the student is responsible for also identifying you know, their own tutoring resources that they might need. Most colleges have those available for all students. Um, and frankly, if you're looking at a college that doesn't have that available, be concerned. Um, and students have to meet all the learning objectives. That comes back to that otherwise qualified. The student takes the exact same test at the exact same difficulty level. They do the same project. They write the same 10 page research paper um, and they have to turn it in on time. Um, just like everyone else, the accommodations come in but we need to identify what the barrier is. Um, so a barrier to equal access, that's something that in this case, the educational system has put in place that is causing a person with an impairment to not have access. Um, so it could be textbooks. Um, textbooks are printed pieces of paper. What if I have a print related disability, some sort of learning disability or an attentional disorder or a visual impairment? Um, if somebody just hands me a textbook, I don't have access. Um, it could be lack of clear information. It could be in specific strict attendance policies that could be a barrier. Timed tasks can be a barrier. Um, dining plans, like if you have a student who has significant allergies or medical conditions, um, you know, everyone's re required to have a dining plan. That could be a barrier. Um, even just simply having to sit quietly for long periods of time um, without and sustain attention uh, without someone there to help kind of keep them cued in. Um, those can be barriers. And it's those things happen because other people assume that everyone learns the same way they do. Um, it doesn't make the professor a bad person. It just simply means that we're not always thinking about the needs of all learners when we structure our educational system. That's where accommodations come in. Accommodations are there so that once we identify the barrier, they can either be removed or mitigated, which means lessened. And accommodations are adjustments that provide equal access to education, goods and services within an institution or frankly in any public place of business, um, any governmental building, anywhere kind of within society um, without fundamentally altering the learning outcomes or the course of the program. So let's break that down. An accommodation has to mitigate or lessen a barrier. Um, it can't alter learning outcomes or pose a fundamental alteration to the course. Um, that's in ADA. In IDEA K-12, it can do that, but in college, it cannot. It can't pose an undue burden on the institution, which could be financial or administrative. Frankly, that very rarely happens because the budget of an entire institution, especially a public institution, is vast. Um, so making that argument is almost never going to work. Um, it has to be supported through the active engagement of the interactive process, which we're about to talk about, it has to be supported in documentation that's provided by the student. And like my office will tell them, you know, what they need to provide, but it has to be provided by the student. And so important, it is not retroactive. So the IDEA, can act retroactively and a student might be able to retake a test that they already took but did more poorly on. They might be able to correct an assignment and turn it in for a better grade. That does not happen in college because the law is not written to go backwards. 
Um, so you get one shot at that test. It's all about what accommodations do you have so that you can perform to the best of your abilities in that test at that one time. And how we figure that out is through the interactive process. Um, and that's a legal term. And really what it is, is it's a collaborative conversation between someone in an office like mine and the student. Um, it's important that the student carry that conversation because they're the adult in the situation. Um, parents or guardians cannot request accommodations on behalf of the student. Um, generally, if they would like to be in on the meeting, I'm always okay with that as long as the student approves. Um, my thing is jumping around. As long as the student approves, um, I'm fine with that, but the student has to be the leader um, in the conversation. And when we talk with a student, the way that it should go is that we talk with them about what it's like to be them as a learner. No one knows you better than you. Uh, we work together in that conversation to talk about from their experiences, what are barriers that they have encountered? What concerns do they have and what might they experience in a college setting? We talk about what potential accommodations they might qualify for. We talk about how they would use those accommodations and students can choose whether they wanna accept or decline an accommodation, that's okay. Um, the disability office determines what the reasonable accommodations are that they would qualify for sometimes, depending on what's being requested. In order for me to make the most educated decision possible, um, I may have to reach out to a faculty member or to someone in an administration so that I have a full understanding of what the course requirements are or of the ins and outs of a certain program before I make a decision. And the disability office then provides the student with their accommodation letter, which I mentioned earlier. It's generally a generic letter, has their name on it, says they're registered with the office, lists their accommodations, and that's it. Um, because other than that accommodation letter, faculty and staff treat all students exactly the same. The only exception is what's on that accommodation letter. Very similar to when it, um, a student has an IEP or a 504. Um, important also to know is that the interactive process, the accommodation process is not a once and done process. You can always contact the disability office. And frankly, something that I always tell my students is if you don't tell me what's going on, I don't know. Um, because I don't have access to your grades. I don't have access to like progress reports um, because the student is the advocate. So the student is kind of on their own to say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Um, and it's all about learning, you know, it's okay to notify those people. Uh, the people in the disability office are here to help advocate for you, to help make sure that you're getting the access to the things you need. Just include me in the process. So what accommodations could be a thing in college? Um, classroom adjustments, that could be getting access to the PowerPoint that the professor uses as class begins. It could be having a volunteer note taker or being able to audio record class lectures. In testing, it might be extra time to finish a test. It might be a distraction reduced testing environment. Some students need to take brief breaks while they're testing. Um, other students might need to have their exam in an accessible format. Perhaps they use reading software um, if they're a student who has a print related disability or a visual impairment. There is so much adaptive technology out there and a lot of it is free. Um, so if you're not already using adaptive tech with your students, um, especially for different reading software, I highly recommend it. Um, there's a software that's called Natural Reader. It's free, it is Mac and PC compatible. It has free apps for iPhone, iPad and Android. And what it does is it will open PDF files, Word documents, um, websites. You can copy and paste anything right into the software. You see it on the screen and it has a big play button. So you hit the button and it starts highlighting the text sentence by sentence and it reads it out loud. You can adjust what the voice sounds like. You can adjust the speed of the reading um, and it's free software. Anyone can download that. Um, and it's something that I use with my students all the time. My office may even work with them so that they still have to purchase a copy of their textbook. But in addition to this paper textbook, that's probably not going to be accessible for them. I work to make sure that they also get a PDF copy of that textbook free of charge so that they can use that adaptive software. There's a lot of reading in college um, that can be, you know, your new best friend. Frankly, when I was getting my doctorate and I was reading all those articles for my dissertation, I used it too. Um, it could be physical accessibility, 
It could be interpreters or other service providers. It could be flexibility adjustments. So perhaps attendance related adjustments. If a student has a chronic health condition or a psychological impairment that may uh, make it difficult for them to attend in person or even virtually sometimes. Um, and even housing and dining adjustments, all of those things, pretty much anything that you come in contact with from the very first time you click on an admissions website until you walk across the stage at graduation, there could be a reasonable accommodation. So let's talk about that transition. In prep, if you're preparing your students, I encourage students to ask the question, well, who am I? What are my strengths? What, is, what are my learning preferences? Do I like to learn visually? Do I, am I a hands-on learner? Um, and to really think about that for themselves. To also be an active participant. Um, even though they're, while they're in K-12, most of them are still under the age of 18, um, I strongly encourage including students in the IEP and the 504 process, especially in high school. Um, at first, they might just sit as, a, as an observer, but by their senior year, I would hope that they're being asked questions and asked for their own feedback. Um, because that's a fantastic practice for them. When they get to college, it's on them. There isn't going to be someone else necessarily that can give that, that feedback or that input. Um, so giving them the opportunity to both practice that and for them to figure out what that means for themselves is fantastic. It also helps them in terms of identity development and developing as a learner. Um, so even you know suggesting some of their own goals, what do they wanna do, what do they see moving forward? Um, working on keeping a calendar. The calendar in your phone, and there's so many other apps that will help you keep a schedule. It's going to be your new best friend as a college student um, because there is all that unmonitored time. And most of, the, most of the time in high school, once students get from one student's transition into college, a lot of things that a lot of students are missing, not just students with disabilities, are how to break down their own large assignments independently, how to kind of structure their day so that they have a manageable amount of downtime and a manageable amount of time to get work done. Um, I tell students, you know, put all of your classes in your calendar, go in once you have your syllabi, put in all the due dates for all the assignments, even put it in to get you, send you like a notification like a week in advance or two weeks in advance if you have a paper coming due or a test that's coming up um, because we need as much um, you know, accountability as possible. Even as an adult, I do the same thing and put those things in my calendar. Um, it's important for the student to be able to work on their self-advocacy skills. So like, do I understand my disability? Can I, can I talk about it? Do I understand some of the ways that um, it causes like me to come across something that might be a barrier for me? Um, to learn how to com communicate, you can do that via role play or modeling. Um, I often work with students who might be transitioning and um, before they've even selected a college, I'll sit with them and we'll do like a mock accommodations meeting for what it might look like in college um, and have them reflect on their past experiences. What was a time, in a time where you felt you were being very successful academically, what were you doing? Where would you go when you needed to study? How were you studying? Um, what type of classes were you taking? in a time where things weren't going so well for you, what was going on? Um, and being able to have that self-reflection so that they can take ownership when they get to college and be able to develop those spaces for themselves. So finding the right fit. Do not go to a college just because you like the campus, just because you like the major that they have, just because you think the dorms look really cool, um, do not go for just any one of those reasons, go for all of those reasons combined. So a student wants to think about the size, how many students are gonna be in their classes with them. Um, the location, accessibility, especially if it's a student with a mobility impairment. Um, if it is a campus built on the side of a hill, that may not be the best choice. Um, what are their admission standards? Because remember, every student, including those with disabilities, has to meet, meet the admissions requirements. Um, do they offer tutoring? So here at Delaware State University, we offer free tutoring in every subject for every student. Um, and we even have it available 24-7, 365 um, with live online tutors. And we also have face-to-face -face tutors. That's for everyone. At some schools, if you want tutoring, you pay extra. Um, so figure that out. Find the right major, find the right fit. Check out the disability office. 
call them and ask them questions that relate to what we've talked about today. Um, and if their answers don't impress you, um, make that part of your decision process. Um, do they have counseling services, if that's something that would be in, of an interest to the student? Frankly, for any student, the college transition is rough, um, especially those first couple weeks, the first month or so. Um, so anyone might benefit from just having a space where they can go and talk it out um, in a confidential, safe setting. Do they have housing on campus? Do you want to be a commuter? Um, if so, how far away are they? Is that something that they would allow? Um, what about online programs? How much of your how much of your schooling is going to be online versus in person? And especially now in the age of COVID, that becomes a very, much more significant question. So now what? You got in, or your student got in. Um, now what happens? Really important things to do. Attend all the pre-orientation activities. Go to them and have the student be there, not just the parent. Um, it is very important. Have the student take notes during those times. Um, many times I will see that when we're leading those types of events, um, that we have a lot of parents signed in and the students are kind of MIA, which is a detriment to them because the students are the ones that are going to be here and the parents generally don't have access to the students records. So if the student hasn't been there to learn the information, um, they really are at a loss and that can make their transition even harder. Meet with the disability office. As soon as, you, as soon as a student has been accepted at a university, they've like signed on the dotted line, said, yes, I intend to enroll in the fall make a meeting with that student disability office, figure out what documentation you might need. Um, that way you have plenty of time to gather it. Um, and like I said before, if a student is coming up or needs in a reevaluation, usually that's about every three years um, in public school setting. Um, I know sometimes there's an option to not reevaluate depending on how they're doing or to reevaluate. Um, if there's an option, reevaluate especially if their previous evaluation didn't had only child-based tests. Um, that can be a huge difference for the student um, because if they don't have accurate and current documentation and it's anything related to a learning disability, um, it's going to be very difficult for them and they may in fact have to pay, like I said before, out of pocket um, and that can be upwards of $4,000. So um, if we can retest, retest. Um, Meet with professors and TAs, there's going to be, there's options to do that and don't be afraid to do it. That helps you pick your fit too. Um, their academic advisor is going to be their best friend. Um, meet with your advisor, meet with them often. Um, they are a huge resource, especially for a student who happens to learn differently because they can get not just tips and tricks from them, but talk with them about, hey, I want to take a class schedule and I think I can handle 12 credits or I think I can handle 14 credits. Um, but I want to make sure that I take at least two classes that are going to definitely be in an area of my strengths. So if my other three classes may be more challenging for me, I know that I have a balanced schedule um, because the, the student has more say over what their schedule is in college for the most part. And that can be a, a trick or a technique that really saves them in the long run um, because the transition is rough for anyone at the, at the very first. Um, so just thinking through that process is really helpful. Um, identifying services that a student might need. So if a student is used to receiving counseling on a regular basis, or perhaps they have a chronic health concern, are there doctors in the area that their doctor would recommend that they could see if they needed to? What kind of health services are on site on the campus? Do they have a health center? If so, does it have a doctor? Are we talking about a nurse practitioner? Um, do they have a pharmacy on campus? Is there someone that can prescribe medication if that were to be necessary? Um, where's the closest pharmacy if you have a student who takes any type of medication and how would they get there? Um, organizing their schedule, identifying the extracurricular activities. There are so many campus organizations, um, you know, whether you're playing intramural sports or here at Dell State, we're a D1 NCAA institution um, and we have lots of sporting options. Um, and it's really important that students connect on all levels, um, not just in their academics. Um, if there are other resources that you're looking for, ask questions um, and introduce yourself as a student. Introduce yourself to other students. Um, it can be kind of daunting at first, um, but you get used to it. Um, and also, don't be afraid to introduce yourself to your professors. Um, some professors teach a lot of students. 
Um, and I tell my students, you know, since you have this accommodation letter, you have the perfect reason to introduce yourself to your professor at the beginning of the semester um, before you need anything. Um, I'll say, you know, you can email the professor your letter. You're going to tell them what specifically you want to use from the letter. Um, that gives you a great opportunity to say, you know, hi, Dr. Smith. My name is Anne, and I'm in your English 101 class that meets Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m. I'm really looking forward to taking your class. I'm attaching my accommodation letter here. In your class, the accommodations that I think are going to be important are my time and a half for exams and audio recording your lectures. Um, I really look forward to being in class with you next week. If you have any questions, please let me know. Like, that is a friendly email. And then the student could even follow up with the professor after class or in their office hours and just say, hey, I sent you that email. I'm Ann. Um, that way the professor knows your face, knows your name, um, because the students who make themselves known in a positive way to their professors are often the students that are going to get the most assistance and the professor is going to be the most willing to work with because they've shown an effort, they've shown that they are engaged in the process. Um, let's see, I'm looking at my notes. I think that's what we covered from there. And so I wanna make sure that you guys have time to ask questions. Um, and so if we have any of those, I can open the chat. Here we go. And you, you are welcome to like unmute your microphones too. Um, let's see. Um, daughter will be transitioning from a community college to a four-year college soon. Um, really important, make sure that any documentation, medical documentation that that community college has on file for them, if they've been getting accommodations in um, a, a two-year school, that you get a copy of that. The accommodations, even from one college to another, don't carry over, so that it's very important that um, the student will register again with the new college's disability office. Um, the accommodations would probably very, be very similar, but every college is different. Every academic program is different. Um, so that's a really important thing to do. How recent does the evaluation have to be to go into college? Great question. That differs from school to school. I have seen some schools where they won't accept something that is more than three years old or where they won't accept something that's more than five years old. Um, I am of the mindset that as long as, if it's a, if it's a psychoeducational evaluation, um, I work under the premise that if the evaluation was done using adult normed inventories, so like um, if you're familiar with any of the tests, the names, um, like the Wexler is an adult norm, the Woodcock Johnson 4 is adult normed, and there's, there's plenty of other ones. Um, I would want to make sure that at least one of those tests in that evaluation is adult normed. Um, and for me, that would be okay. I would take that, even if it's you know, a little old, if it, even if it's a few years older. Some schools will not. So that's why I say when you're checking into future colleges, look at specifically their documentation requirements. Um, and if it's possible to retest a student um, when they're in that, whatever that third round or, th or that, that three year gap is, if they're coming up for a reevaluation, evaluate them. Um, do colleges usually have testing centers? Um, sometimes, usually for at least, well, I won't speak for every single college, generally speaking, um, that there is some sort of option or a testing location where students with disabilities who receive testing adjustments um, can go to take their test, whether it, it's a need for extra time or reduced distraction environment or to be able to take breaks. Um, sometimes that might be run through the disabilities office. Sometimes there might be like a professional testing center on campus here at Delaware State University. We are very fortunate. Um, we have a testing center that proctors high stakes tests um, for pretty much the entire eastern seaboard. So not just people with disabilities, but they also will work with my students. Um, and generally those things happen, whether it's the testing center that's within a disability office or a formalized testing center at a, at a campus. Um, that option is there in the event that the professor for whatever reason, doesn't have the resources to proctor the exam themselves. So um, professors are welcome to proctor the exam. And I always tell them, as long as the student is getting their approved accommodations, I'm good with that. Um, but you, but there is, generally speaking, there is an option, whether it's a formal testing center or not, but yes, um, because the university as a whole is responsible for making sure that the student's accommodations are provided. 
it's not just the professor's responsibility. It's not just the disabilities office responsibility. It's a university responsibility. Um, can we get copies of the slides? Absolutely. I will send those to Mrs. Duncan. Psyche Valrick before the ninth grade. Took the Wexler. In a few months, you certainly could do that. Um, does the school system provide psychoed testing within the school system? Because if so, um, you may not have to pay out of pocket for Kennedy Krieger. Um, I'm really familiar with Kennedy Krieger. They're a fantastic um, institution. They do amazing work. Um, so if you're working with them, I know you're getting very good care. Um, and if it was just a straight psychological evaluation, yet that could be with Kennedy Krieger. It could be even if if it's a psychological if it's a psychological impairment, um, the documentation could even come from just simply a licensed mental health professional, licensed counselor, licensed therapist, licensed clinical social worker, psychologist, psychiatrist, um, sometimes even a neurologist. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a full like psychological eval if it's a psychological impairment. Oh, your insurance, okay, well, you have the best insurance ever. Don't ever leave that insurance company if your insurance company paid for the whole eval. Um, that's fantastic. Um, more and more insurances are covering it in part, but very few are covering it in total. Um, so if, you, if your insurance covers it, then yes, I would say schedule with them, get on a waiting list so that they get that done their 12th grade year, that will absolutely benefit you. Public schools in Maryland has changed their policies about working with kids who are enrolled in private schools. Yeah, if it's private, um, it is different. Um, the school system, if it were in a public school or a charter school, they still have to make sure that they're doing all of the, the testing on that three-year rotating scale. If it's a private school, then um, they don't necessarily have to. That depends really on how they're receiving funding and if they receive any federal funding. That's where it would denote what part of the federal law, if any, they have to follow. Um, and so that's kind of, it's always a gray area. But yeah, if it's a private school, if it's a fully private school where they're not receiving any federal funding at all, then no, they are not required to provide testing within the school system. Um, usually they'll still provide resources for where people can go to get testing. Um, and sometimes they will still help facilitate the testing themselves. Um, but if there is no federal dollars coming into that institution on a regular basis as part of their like known budget, then they're not required to follow those guidelines or those laws in terms of ADA. Good question though. Any other questions? When should all the paperwork for accommodations, evals, et cetera, be submitted to the school during the application process after the student is already admitted? Um, because they can't provide accommodations to a student until that student is a student of their institution. So here at Delaware State University, um, what I'm doing is I'm approving or I'm determining accommodations, which then become federal mandates on behalf of the student, but I can only approve Delaware State University accommodations for Delaware State University students. Um, so go through the application process. The, the documentation won't be considered in the application process anyway. Sometimes um, I'll have people say, well, you know, if I send in their evaluation with the application, would, would they take that into consideration? The answer is no, um, because under the ADA, that could be seen as a discriminatory practice and the school could actually be in, um, be in a state of being liable. Um, so we cannot do that. Um, but anytime after you're accepted, the green light is on. Um, I actually have just spoken with at least five families here at DSU um, whose students or the student themselves is accepted for fall 2021 and they're already reaching out because their student did um, early admission. Um, so I've got meetings scheduled with some of those students, you know, this coming week. Um, and I've said to them, hey, we don't have to meet this early because your classes don't start just yet, um, but they wanna get it in. And that's fantastic that they wanna be that kind of proactive. Um, a tip I'll give you is that once you submit that documentation and it's all in there, if your student wants to meet early, um, that's great but have them schedule a follow-up meeting with the disability office closer to when classes start, even if it's just like a 25 to 30 minute conversation so that the disability office can go back over with them what their approved accommodations are 
so that if they have any last minute questions, they can be addressed because it's a long time from now until for us, August 28th, um, when classes are gonna start for fall. Um, so just you know, being mindful about that too. And there's just so much information that students are gonna receive because they're transitioning to college um, that I don't want things like that to get lost in the shuffle. But that's a really good question. Any other questions? Those are good ones. People can unmute if they want um, and just ask questions verbally if that you're more comfortable with that too. Well, Dr. Nettler, um, thank yes. you so much for your time and sharing mm -hmm. your expertise for us today. We really appreciate it. Um, to our, our participants, um, if you guys have any questions moving forward, um, Dr. Nettler, would it be okay if, if any other questions come up that I send them your direction in, Absolutely. in the future? Absolutely. Yeah, please do. Okay. Fantastic. So, um, again, thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing with us. We really appreciate your time and your expertise and um, helping us, you know, figure out the next steps moving from from St. Mary's Riken into whatever whatever lays ahead for our students. So thank you, I appreciate it. World. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks, guys, for giving me some of your time today. Um, and yeah.